Welcome, everybody, to the IEPP Global Privacy Summit Online 2021 program, Privacy and Data Governance, the Key to Unlocking Privacy at Scale, sponsored today by Wirewheel. Um, my name is Dave Cohen. I'm the IEPP Senior Knowledge Manager. I'll be your host for today's program. We're going to get started in just a moment, but before we do, a couple of quick housekeeping details for all of you. If you're an IEPP Certified Privacy Professional and you have your certification with us, we will automatically grant one CPE credit to you for registering through our website. If you're listening to this program either live or as a recording and you'd like that credit, you can also get that through filling out a very easy to fill out form on the IEPP website under the certification tab. A reminder that today's program is being recorded and will be posted on the IEPP site uh, within about 24 hours. Also available at that time will be a link where you can download a PDF of these slides. So if you're wondering in advance whether you can get a copy of the slides, you can. We'll make them available for download when we post the recording. And again, that will be within just about 24 hours. We encourage you to ask questions throughout this program. There's a chat function in the bottom center of your screen. Uh, please submit questions all throughout the program. We really encourage this to be interactive. So post your questions in there. We're going to get to them either in line or during a designated Q&A period toward the end. And uh, with that, let's move ahead and I'd like to introduce today's panelists. Justin Antoni Pillay is the CEO at Wirewheel. Justin, it's great to have you with us today. Uh, Justin's going to be a moderator for our panel. So uh, welcome, Justin. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and the company? Uh, Dave, thanks very much for having me, as always. Um, and uh, we're really looking forward to a phenomenal discussion uh, on this important topic around privacy compliance and data governance which we're seeing grow as a real area of interest uh, among the privacy community. Um, but as always, Dave, love being on with you, really, really looking forward to the discussion. And um, of course, you know, I'm with Wirewheel. Um, uh, I'm the CEO and Wirewheel is a complete data privacy platform that helps companies with all phases of data privacy compliance, um, both trust, access, and consent. So full subject rights automation, consent and preference, uh, delivery back to the consumer, that entire set of challenges. And then of course, on privacy operations management. Um, and I'll be covering a little bit later our full suite of offerings. Um, and I'm delighted to introduce my our, our panelists here today. So um, first um, from Microsoft, Lynn Bird. And Lynn, if you don't mind, I'll turn it over to you to give a little bit of your background. Sure. Thanks, Justin. So um, I am, as Justin said, Lynn Bird. I am specifically, I work in the Microsoft IT space um, and carry the title of privacy program owner. So I'm responsible for ensuring privacy in that area. I actually come to privacy by root of program management. So I have spent the last several decades um, coming up through the technical route, as opposed to a lot of the folks who are in the privacy space who have more of a legal or compliance background. Lynn, thanks so much. And, and it's gonna be a, a great part of the discussion today because as we'll talk about a little bit later, you have been leading a lot of the teams at Microsoft that are actually doing this on the ground, practically bringing the data governance um, efforts and tools together with the efforts with uh, privacy compliance. So I'm really looking forward to that part of the discussion. Uh, and also joining us here today from Deloitte, uh, Samir Ansari, uh, Managing Director of the Cyber Risk uh, Team. So Samir, do you mind getting a little bit of background? Uh, yeah, for thank you for the community today? Sure, thanks, Justin. So Samir Ansari, uh, as you mentioned, Managing Director uh, within our Cyber Risk Group. Um, I focus primarily on data risk, which covers uh, privacy, data protection, and data governance. And actually, uh, previous to me being back at Deloitte, I'm actually a boomerang to Deloitte, I actually was um, the head of privacy, uh, data protection, and data governance at a large uh, investment management firm. So I kind of uh, have the, the view of the consulting angle of seeing what a lot of different organizations are doing and also kind of owning the problem from an, an industry perspective within an in-house function. Well, great. Well, Samir, again, uh, really appreciate you joining and uh, I'm really looking forward to the discussion. So why don't we jump on in? There's a lot for us to cover today. And Samir, why don't we start 
uh, on your side. And one of the main things that comes up in this area of data governance and privacy compliance are just what are the frameworks, what are the tools, and how do the two sides really start to talk to each other? So why don't we turn it over to you to provide a framework and a background for this discussion today? Yeah, so I, th I think what we typically have been seeing is that when we think about um, value-based data risk management, we, we typically see kind of a siloed approach uh, or a siloed operating model. So if we think about the data operating model in terms of three kind of functions, in terms of data protection, data privacy, and then ultimately data management, which encompasses data governance, um, we tend to see those three functions kind of sitting silo, right? So data protection, when you think about it historically in terms of what's required to protect that data based on risk and regulatory requirements, data privacy, you know, really focusing on the privacy by design elements and focusing on the use of personal data. And then data management, <clears throat> really thinking about a kind of a broader stroke um, of, you know, how do you get value out of your data, that data as an asset? You know, what does data quality start to look like? How do you think about um, data discovery? And also what are the data needs of the business, right? And they're servicing the, the entire business. And what we tend to see in terms of a, a challenge to, I think, um, really achieving privacy at scale is that each of these functions tend to operate a lot of times in silos. And what does that really lead to, right? So an inefficiency of duplication of multiple data repositories that aren't connected in any way. Um, ultimately, you see duplication of tool or licensing. So data discovery tools, privacy may be you know, going out to look for. Data management, data governance may actually already have some capabilities in that space. And sometimes they aren't talking to each other and therefore you get these duplications. And there's also a lot of times within data management, you have these data catalogs. And I think your privacy and data protection folks aren't quite sure how to use those data catalogs. Um, so you know, the tooling space, I think can sometimes cause some redundancy. Um, and then also ultimately, I think, you know, one of the big issues from a silo perspective is that the internal customers aren't quite sure who to go to and aren't quite sure in terms of what the different definitions or requirements are, whether we talk about data or whether we talk about what are some of the requirements in terms of the control environment. So I think that leads to a lot of um, either inefficiencies or potentially redundancies that I think makes it very difficult for internal consumers to really understand who they need to go to and how do they actually solve the problem as being accountable for some of these issues rather than just the second line kind of pushing some of these things down. So I think the question becomes, well, what does the integrated model really start to look like? I think we go to the next slide, Justin, we can talk a little bit about what does an integrated kind of operating model start to look like and what's the value of that? So when we think about this, it's really what are the handoffs between each of these functions? Um, so from a data strategy perspective, they're owning a lot of the data catalog, the glossary, the taxonomy, collecting the metadata and understanding what the data lineage is, right? So how does the data flow through the organization? And that's really key. I think to achieving some of that you know, data privacy at scale in terms of feeding into your data privacy program in terms of what data do you have? How is it flowing through the organization? And a lot of times through some of that metadata, you can start to tag you know, really and understand you know, what consent is given, what notice was that data collected under? And that allows you know, your, your privacy folks to really start to understand how they can leverage their, their data strategy, their data management tools to effectively implement you know, their data privacy program. And the same from a data protection perspective in terms of, you know, they need to understand how do you actually start. Oh, sorry, got muted there. And understand what controls are actually in place um, to, uh, to really control that data through at rest and at motion as well. But I think a lot of these concepts really start to come together and start to get implemented from a privacy by design perspective in terms of that data architecture that they can work with their data governance or their data strategy and management folks to really start to implement and get those requirements really baked in and really start to get that strength and that scale that you're really gonna to need to start to, to deliver. And I think this is where Lynn, you, know, you could probably shed some light in terms of how does this actually come to life in terms of you know, what's actually happening on the ground. And Samir, if you, if you don't mind, uh, if I may, before we jump in. So I think all of us uh, miss the part of a normal IAPT conference where there's actual interaction between, you know, the community and folks who are on the, on the panel. Sure. So uh, I'll, I will just ask, you know, we, I see a lot of friendly faces in, you know, who have joined us here today. And um, 
if you could ask questions of uh, Samir, Lynn and I, as we're going through the presentation today, it makes it a lot more interactive and we can focus a little bit on where you, uh, you know, uh, you know here, who are joining us here today, where you actually have questions. Uh, so just post them to the chat and uh, Lynn, myself and Samir can pick them up. Um, Samir, if I may, before we pivot over to Lynn for a moment. Sure. You know, there is, there is an important part of the framework that is just about making sure that the data privacy teams here represented on your left bottom uh, side really understand the kind of tooling and goals that are, that are happening in the data strategy management and the data protection side. So yep. I'll just ask a couple of things to make sure. Um, can you talk through just for a few minutes about how you see data strategy and management teams using a data catalog, including the metadata side, and the concept of data lineage. If yeah. when you really, when you talk through how those are just being used, the data cataloging and the data lineage um, sort of goals and tools in the data strategy and management side, what, what have you seen? And, and, and can you bring some of that over to the data privacy side? Yeah, so I think you know what we see there is a lot of the, the data management folks are establishing these data catalogs to really start to inventory and help people understand what data is actually within their organization and start to define what do they know about that data, what can that data be used for, um, and you know I think that's where privacy needs to be a key stakeholder as your data governance, data management folks start to actually go out and actually start to procure those tools because there's going to be a need for data privacy to leverage some of the metadata that's there, right? When we talk about metadata, it's the data about data. It gives context to what that data is. And I think that starts to help, you know, privacy professionals start to solve some of their issues, whether you talk about records of processing activities or actually having to serve that data back from a consent or from a data subject uh, rights perspective. So I think those data catalog tools start to, you know, give more context in terms of the data and the assets that you have. And I think that's where the, um, the, the benefit to the privacy function comes because that's essentially your, your dictionary, uh, you know, un help you understand all that data that's there. Um, and then the lineage is very key as well because it starts to understand how that data flows through an organization and what the source of that data is, right? And I think for the privacy professionals, you know, you think about what notice was that data collected under? What can I do with that data? What was that point of collection? And then where has it gone since? And you know, then also a lot of times with where there's quality issues, you can start to identify where do those quality issues start to come into play. So those are some of the, I think, the key concepts that data strategy or data governance will own that I think privacy should really start to, you know, be at least a stakeholder and understand, you know, what the organization's philosophy is on that and how they're actually servicing, servicing up that, that service. And, and it's key here because a lot on the data strategy side and management, Samir, that we've seen, those programs and the tools are really built for helping a company use the data yeah. more, right? It's really yeah. about understanding in different systems what the data is and where it came from. And when you get into data quality, that's really about enabling different parts of the organization to use the data more. And so we've often seen that there might not even be a voice when you're setting up the data governance teams of collecting the right data for use by the data privacy team. Is that, does that resonate with you? Yeah, I think that absolutely makes sense. And when I think about this, um, I think sometimes about the offensive use of data and the, what I'll call the defensive side of data. So the offensive side, I think to your, to your point, Justin, is about you know, data catalog saying, okay, what are our data assets and how do we use them appropriately and get value out of them? Um, and then, you know, I think a lot of times from a defensive side of things, it's the compliance, it's the security, it's the privacy side of things, but they're not necessarily mutually exclusive, right? And I think that's where privacy folks can help become enablers and saying, hey, there are these data assets and they can provide context in terms of how this data can actually be used. And also I've seen issues where data quality, well, yes, it helps drive value. It can also, data quality issues can sometimes cause compliance issues from a privacy perspective um, that, you know, you tend to have to deal with in a reactive way. Yeah, no doubt about it. Well, and that's a perfect segue to Lynn. And Lynn, you know, obviously Microsoft has a huge public focus and has 
made it a value proposition around bringing privacy into the tools. And your team has been actually implementing uh, from the privacy compliance side and the governance side, bringing the two together. So I love the way you caption this, the slide, Lynn, a practical approach at scale. So uh, Lynn, uh, do you mind if I pivot over to you to, to cover some of the learnings in this area? Sure. So I, I, Justin, if, if folks don't mind, I'm going to start and give a little bit of context to the space at Microsoft that I function in, because I think that's a useful context for a lot of other folks who are trying to do this. Um, so as I said in the, in the introduction, I fall into the IT space um, and we leverage applications as our foundational element amongst other things for compliance versus processes or campaigns, but the principles are the same regardless. We cover more than a thousand applications in the scope of our privacy program and it includes a combination of first, third party and hybrid apps. And then we our, our service spans multiple different organizations within the division. And the, re, the reason I call this out is it speaks to the complexities that we have to cover in that we typically don't just handle one single scenario. So it's not simple in terms of just being able to stand up a very defined process. It needs to be flexible. And then I think that the problem that many privacy teams run into, we're relatively small. We're actually a team of six that covers that scope. And I, I think that's useful to understand because it helps um, give context to why we're taking the approach um, that we've taken. So the, the first thing we did, and I can't lay claim to this, one of my very smart colleagues drove our GDPR um, initiative to get us to compliant at that point in time, but took a step back and said, traditional compliance doesn't make sense given where privacy is going. Um, and part of that is because uh, traditional compliance models, they tend not to be all that scalable or flexible, they're controls based, and there's often a lot of resistance to um, changing those controls and shifting them over time. And if you look at how the privacy landscape is changing, still it's it's an evolving landscape so it didn't make a whole lot of sense secondly i mean most folks who come from the compliance space who have dealt with compliance know that it's it's very reactive it's usually more than nine months before you have a good sense of where your issues are and given privacy by design again didn't make a whole lot of sense and typically a slow annual rob so we chose to do this thing that we refer to as pras privacy as a service um, nice little buzzword um, for, for all those obvious reasons. And with that comes a core set of principles that we try and drive to as we're evolving our, our program. So just in the interest of transparency, we don't, we're not doing this um, to the degree that we would like to see PRAS in our program. This is our continuum of where we'd like to get to. So the key principles for us are um, having a customer experience obsession. And most important in that is understanding who your customers are. For us, the customers are not the regulators. They're not the auditors. They're the folks who actually have to implement the requirements. Um, and then once you've defined who they are, you can take a step back and say, well, how do we actually enable them to deliver compliance? Which, which segues very nicely into looking at what tools are already in place that they're using today. So a, a great example for us and, um, is we already had tools in place to inventory our assets. That is not something we wanted to reinvent. Um, there was enormous value for us in terms of leveraging that existing infrastructure and so by plugging into that, we trigger our privacy process based on steps that those teams already had to take. So when they complete their inventory, immediately um, privacy is integrated into that process. There's no bypassing the privacy process. Secondly, we looked at where the engineers get their other requirements. How does that come into their process? So we've, when we trigger the privacy process, 
um, based on some key indicators, we then provide the privacy work items into their backlog. No different than any other requirement today. Um, so that really speaks to some of the stuff in the bottom in the blue, which I'm, I'm not going to go into in great detail, but those are the elements and criteria <clears throat> that we wanted to ensure that we were meeting in terms of prayers. If I may, Lynn, it, just ask a couple of items, because I do think you covered three critical items that are at least that are that would be incredibly helpful to a lot of the privacy community. So I'm just going to go back through them and ask a couple. Perfect. So this the communication between privacy teams and engineers mm -hmm. is often one of the most painful things we hear about in privacy program management. And what I mean by that is, if you layer in the policy in every stage of the way, when a privacy team is actually talking to virtually or in the context of an assessment, is talking to a, an engineering team, you get caught in a loop, a, a, literally a repeated loop of what do you mean by that? Yeah. <laughs> so. When somebody says, who's the owner of the system? Who has access to the data? What are you, where are you processing the information? Um, what, are the, what is sensitive PI? What is non-sensitive PI? All of those in some ways are layering on like a legal or policy framework. And it makes it very difficult for the privacy team to actually communicate in a scalable way with engineers and product people who don't live day to day in all the definitions under different policy regimes. That's, that's a place where you covered stripping away policy and focusing just as a practical matter on where the engineering team lives and breathes. Can you talk about that a little bit and yeah. how you managed to bridge that before we get to the tooling side of it? Yeah. So, so you jumped into the second point, which I hadn't gotten to, but so really, we see that, uh, Justin, as you rightly called out, as a key point, a key function for our team is how do we actually take the policy out of it for our customers? They don't need to understand the policy. They need to understand the requirement. Um, and that really is key. So when we give them work items, in the case of they've got an ADL work item to meet, let's say, data retention um, controls. We actually spell out that they need to have a data retention plan. They need to be clear on how they're meeting that data retention plan. We put it into engineering speak. What is the engineering requirement? Not what is the policy? And, and that is key. And the other thing to be open to is hear the feedback from your customers. We have gone umpteen iterations and that's part of why it's always been super critical to us that we have tools that we, we can evolve as we're using them, because we take the feedback from our customers seriously. Hey, we're really struggling to understand how to interpret that. Or we find we're getting um, responses that we hadn't expected, which comes into the third point, deciding with data. We regularly take a look at the output we're receiving and going and, and question whether that makes sense. So those are, you immediately have a feedback loop as to whether you've been successful in doing that. And don't be frightened to then go back to your customers and say, hey, what are you struggling about uh, with this? And we'll often then work in conjunction with our legal folks to refine that, to ensure we're still meeting um, the essence of what's required, but putting it in, framing it up in a way that it makes sense in the engineering world. So Lynn, honestly, that, that makes a lot of sense. This concept of the engineers need to know the requirements, but not forcing them to answer based on like legal words yeah. is really is really helpful. I think we could cover that probably for an entire session itself, I suspect. Yeah. You know, what does that mean? Yeah. Um, but I, I'd like to give you some space to go through the rest of these items, Lynn, because there's a couple of others on here that are worth the discussion. And, yeah. and one thing, you know, there are a fair number of questions coming up already from the audience, which I knew there would be. So we can pivot over to some of these in a few minutes as you as you continue. Yeah, so I, I just want to um, loop back to something that Samir called out on a prior slide. Data lineage is, is a great example in terms of abstracting away policy. 
you know, we need to know where the data was originally um, retained and, and under what context. When you start talking about data lineage, your technical folks tend to understand that concept because it's been around for a while. Your leadership tend to understand that concept. So again, look for ways to use existing tools and processes. You don't need to re reinvent the wheel. Um, and then the last item that I'm gonna cover on this slide is, is deciding with data. Um, we try really hard to use data to determine where there's actual risk as opposed to my gut says. One of the things I've seen time and time again is, and I, I get it's part of the maturing process, is programs that don't um, drive to having discrete data points. Uh, and I'll give you an example of that, is, is too, too much freeform text in your uh, PIAs, your privacy reviews. If you don't have discrete data points, you're actually robbing your program of an opportunity to mine that data to be able to determine where you've got risk. And the reality is right out of the gate, it, it takes a while to build a set of data. That's where you have an opportunity. If you've got security programs and um, data management programs in your business, they likely have data that is of value to you as a privacy program that you can leverage to start determining areas of, of where to spend time and proactively minimize risk. So that was what I had on, on that um, slide, Justin. That, that makes great sense. And structuring as many of the data points as structured answers as opposed to free form yep. does make the data more usable. Um, I'm only gonna go cover one more point before we, there's a lot on here, Lynn, that, but the leveraging existing tools and processes, you made a, you know, you covered that a bit earlier, but there's this concept of an asset inventory and then the concept of data discovery. And in a lot of conversations in the privacy space, and again, Samir, you could probably weigh in too, the concept of an asset inventory and data discovery, I've often heard combined into sort of um, into the same. So understanding what your asset is and then understanding what the data is in that asset mm -hmm. is, is two separate things and often is not even contained in the same technical tool. So Lynn, you talked a little bit about leveraging some concept of an asset inventory. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what, what an asset inventory is, for example, as, as distinct from you know, something like a metadata catalog, because that, that itself is often not well understood, if, if, if you would mind. Sure. So for us, when we talk about assets, and, and I, I need to be very careful because we is not the broader Microsoft. We in, in our area uh, within Microsoft, for us, that is services and components. And we colloquially use the term applications. I have seen other areas where the asset may be campaigns if you're more in a sales and marketing space, or it may be more at the process level. And I don't think there is a right or a wrong answer to what your asset might be. It really depends on what makes sense for the, the area of the business you're in or the business that you're in. Um, Justin, to your point, in an ideal world, we like to have the data inventory associated up to those assets. And then you've got the additional layer for privacy, which is always, so what's the context? What's the business purpose? And those three things actually live as a set in an ideal world. Because if you understand those three things, it, it gives you a lot of scope uh, in terms of how you manage that at scale. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and like an example, I, I like to give just because so many folks use a CRM, Lynn, is, you know, your asset might be your CRM. The data inventory is the kinds of data that you're that are resident in your CRM, right? That's two different challenges. But even getting a really good inventory of what your assets are can be complicated because they're, you know, you need the right tooling for that. And tracking something as a component, or as you said, as a system, which might be a collection of components, 
itself can be tricky. So you, there's a lot there for us to cover. Maybe we can pick that up in the discussion point in a few minutes. Um, and that does take us into the next um, slide here, Len. So back over to you. Thanks, Justin. So this slide is really intended to, to give the sense, I touched on it briefly, briefly in the previous slide, is PRAS is a continuum. I don't know of any privacy program or I haven't encountered one that is, is doing what we would define as, as pure PRAS. It's a journey to get there. So like most privacy programs, we're constantly evolving and every piece of work or project that we undertake, we ask the question as to whether it's going to move us closer to a PRAS model. A great example um, in terms of wrapping your head around it is, is the bottom item that I'll, I'll walk through in terms of metrics. So for many less mature, smaller programs, metrics are often manually generated. Um, they're incredibly time consuming. And as a result, the breadth uh, is not that great. They're typically pretty, pretty limited. The next step along is to get to centralized automated metrics. So you're running um, some basic functions and you have the ability to pull those, those metrics, generate those metrics in some sort of automated manner. Um, it's more scalable, but it's often still presumptive. Um, and the challenge we often find is not always that intuitive for our customers to discern what's, what's the action based on a status. The ultimate goal is moving to the right where you actually want to be able to have, uh, be reflecting health health and risk data, uh, initially not, not necessarily real time, but ultimately on a real time continuum. The obvious thing here um, for most people who are living um, privacy on a daily basis is you'll recognize that to get to, over to the right, you need to have tools in place uh, that will support those regular feeds and be able to provide you with those health indicators. Um, and so you're not going to necessarily do it all out of the gate. The way we've approached it is come back to data-driven um, decision-making. We've, we've analyzed our data and we've said, well, here are two or three high-risk areas where we're gonna get real value. Those are the ones we wanna start pushing um, actively into the health feed space. So we have real-time indicators as to what the health in these areas are and we can then proactively go and address that. So we kind of span some centralized automated into the health space, but we're not sitting with all our metrics in, in one area on that continuum. So we will continue to move to the right, but um, the advice I, I would give you is look at where you can um, identify key areas of risk and then start driving um, that. The other thing is, again, coming full circle to the um, data management security programs. Look at what those programs are doing. Um, we've had great success with being able to leverage similar mechanisms that those programs already had in place. Um, and the huge plus there is by going down that road, you broker the dialogue with those teams. Um, you start becoming partners. Um, you start driving in a common direction, as well as the fact that both your customers, the engineers, and your leadership have probably already engaged with those programs, and they're familiar with a lot of what they're doing. So by building on top of that, there's instant recognition from those folks. So that those have all been, I don't want to say unintended um, positives, but certainly positives of taking more of a collaborative approach. Again, Lynn, the reporting side is critical and the way you've covered it uh, is very, very aligned with where we see privacy programs maturing along the continuum. It's often exactly as you say, trying to get a basic handle on metrics so that it can be reported up, trying to get much more automated metrics so you're not literally recreating the wheel every month, every quarter, and then you want to get to the point where you not only have metrics about how your program's operating, but you can start seeing the risks in a more automated way. And that, that takes often a lot more work if, unless you've 
really spent time structuring the data feeds to collect data that gives you that insight. So there is a maturity process to this, but I think the way you've covered it makes a lot of sense. Um, so I'm, we have, again, a lot of questions. I'm gonna move from here into some examples of taking what Samir and Lynn have covered. And there's, there's critical components. There's, um, you know, Lynn, how, you know, some of the points you covered, how do you start thinking about abstracting away the policy and enabling your line leaders to actually give you better data in that way? How do you leverage existing tooling that you may have uh, and existing team insights? And how do you get to better uh, reporting out of them? And that ties in well to what Samir was covering, which is in most organizations, in fact, in every organization, there's somebody currently worried about the data security side in some way, right? You usually have, if not somebody that's your lead security person, but maybe a team and an existing organization. And then we're seeing more organizations as Samir identified, focused on data governance and data privacy, usually just a little bit behind the data security or data protection side. So how do we start or how have we seen companies starting to bring some of the two sides of what Samir and Lynn covered? Um, so I, I thought I'd cover some examples of this. Um, in, in many organizations, we fundamentally still see data privacy quite separate from the governance programs. There's more, especially we've seen at larger enterprises where this is starting to come together in the way that Samir and Lynn have identified. And those companies are starting to get some great scale out of it. But to operationalize some of the things that uh, we talked about earlier, right now we still see often the privacy team initiating a privacy exercise. And that's often starting at this point still with I'm assessing this thing. So that's usually what we see in the first level with many, many companies. I'm going to conduct a privacy assessment of this thing. Um, to come to, you know, to build on what Lynn said, the, the better scalability, even if you're just implementing as a privacy program, we've seen has been on, as Lynn said, abstracting away from your manual surveys, questions that are just embedded with policy and trying to get to a layer where you're collecting as much base information from teams who have to who have other jobs. So the more that these can be simplified and and questions are understandable in you know in the terms of developers or a product or using phrases if you're going to marketing that marketing understands, that brings scalability. Because in the absence of that, we really see privacy teams struggling with the having to explain every single phrase at every program in order to collect basic data. Um, the second thing we've seen as a real benefit gets to what Samir and, and Lynn were referring to earlier, which is the privacy team often will need to live in a privacy tool, but the more that you, we've seen that your engineering team and your developers or your other teams can stay in their existing tooling for as long as possible, the better, the better and more likely you are to collect the data in a scalable way. So Lynn highlighted that, for example, a lot of the information, it sounds like Lynn, is collected, for example, in ADO, which is one of Microsoft's developer tools, right? From the developers, if, if you can keep collecting as much as possible in a natural environment, you tend to get scale. It, every time you're asking somebody to pivot into something else, there's a, there's a point of, of friction. And that's a second place where thinking about those two steps, in other words, making sure that every question lives in at the scale of the developers or the marketers or the program managers, 
and then trying to enable them to collect that data in their own organic tools brings some scale even before you've connected over to the governance side of the house. And then we still see today the governance side conducting, and it might be the governance side, it might be your IT team that are conducting asset inventories um, and metadata programs, metadata systems. So just again, to build on what Samir and Lynn talked about, an asset inventory is, may literally be, what are the major systems? Where are they? Who are the owners, right? It might be very basic information about what the systems are. And we often see those asset inventories currently run by an IT team. They might be run by your security team. They might be run by um, a governance team. But there's a critical step where people are trying to at least collect together what are the systems. And you know, so that'll be one set of assets you might have somewhere in your organization. And then in parallel with that, we see more and more organizations really trying to then catalog the data. And that might be in a separate tool. It might be in a separate team, to Samir's point. And so we often see in, in even small organizations, or medium-sized organizations, there are really good resources of what are the systems in the asset inventory world or what is the data, but those systems and information are quite separate from the data governance side, I mean, the data privacy side. And so the privacy team is kind of redoing a lot of work that, that has already been captured. Um, so an example of where you can start bringing these things together uh, first, focus, as we've said, on enabling the questionnaires that go out or the gathering of information via surveys to have as little privacy legal frameworks built into them as possible. Keep it simple, strip out the legal language, strip out the privacy language, and you start getting scalability simply because you don't have to explain every single question. Um, we've seen real scale in not only pulling the data catalog information, but by nearly <laughs> aligning your data privacy program with any kind of asset inventory that a company has. And I'm, I'm just gonna spend a moment on this because I think Lynn covered it, but it can be transformational for a program. And why is that? Many privacy teams are starting to go ahead and assess something without having fully thought through what the something is. And, and this can be hard. You know, when you go to a marketing department, a marketing department may not think of their CRM separate from the marketing program, separate from their customer success program. They think of it as an entire thing. And so the more that you can define what is the thing that you're assessing and having it aligned to the way your IT team or your governance team or your security team has actually defined the asset, the more scale you get out of the program. So we've seen some really, really interesting scalable approaches by pulling either the asset information or in a more advanced case, both the asset information and the metadata information from existing resources. Um, that can often then give you the ability to enrich those, those static data sources or, or you know, more dynamic data sources with, um, with the survey-based approach. And by the time the privacy leads, the legal team is actually reviewing something the, 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 the assessments are now fed by live and, and more up-to-date information, and it makes your privacy calls more, uh, more usable and more usable for more around the enterprise. And here's where you start getting more evergreen programs for the privacy team, and the governance team can start enriching their view not only for what the data is and what the system is, but there is very valuable information that you're actually collecting in a privacy program that as Lynn said, the more you can structure it, 
that data becomes usable not only by the privacy compliance team, but by other parts of your organization. And that's really a goal that is on a maturity curve for a lot of companies. Um, so that's an example. Now, there have been a lot of questions so far that I thought maybe we could, uh, between Lynn, Samir, uh, and, and I, we might start tackling. So I'm gonna throw out a few of these. Um, and then before we go into some of the, the sort of recommendations we have out of it. Now, uh, I, I'm gonna pose this to both of you, but in, in our slides, we've been talking a lot about data governance, data protection, um, and privacy. One question we received for Lynn and, and uh, Samir, where would data ethics, where does that flow? Or where do you see that sitting uh, if, we're, if we're thinking about uh, a framework that looks like this? And Lynn, maybe I'll start with you and then go to Samir. Uh, Justin knows this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. So I, I actually think ethics is the umbrella that, that straddles all three of these. Um, and it's, it's a weird one because what we see happening often because Ethics is not well established. It's where privacy was uh, probably five years ago. No one knows where to put those questions, so they come into the data privacy um, funnel. But quite honestly, it, it is a combination of these three things functioning together under a bigger umbrella, in, in my opinion. And I know I'm vastly oversimplifying, but that's my, my take on where it's going. I, I don't think... In five years, we will be talking about um, these things separately without the umbrella of ethics. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think I think that makes sense, Lynn. I, I think if you have to concentrate it, it's probably somewhere between the bottom two in terms of data privacy and data strategy and management. Um, I think especially when you think about if data science tends to sit under the, the data strategy or data management bucket, we're talking about value of data. And this is a question, you know, we talk to a lot of organizations about is privacy is based a lot of times on regulation and saying what you can or can't do with someone's personal data. Um, I think the underlying question there is around the ethics question of should you be doing that with somebody's data? And is that what the organization wants to be known for? Um, so that way, if it gets known that, hey, you're looking at this data in a certain way, you would stand behind it and say, yes, we're not, you know, at least not maybe necessarily proud of it, but yes, we, we stand behind the use of that data for, for the reason. So that's, that's at least kind of where I, I tend to see it. Well, that makes a lot of sense. And this builds on another question we received, which is um, in my privacy program manager role, I'm responsible for data protection and data strategy and management, but it's not a huge enterprise. How does one get the expertise to be able to understand how to implement all of these systems. And, and this, again, Lynn and Samir, this builds on some questions we were talking about earlier, which is there's not, it's not like there's governance 101 for privacy professionals. So how does one start to think about it in terms of bringing these into your privacy program? And maybe Samir, I'll start with you and then back to Lynn. Yeah. I mean, the way I view data privacy, right, it's, it's, it is data governance. It's a subset of governance in terms of the data that you're governing, right? So, you know, when you think about governance, it's like, what are the rules associated with the data? So I think being able to, you know, if you can understand any one of these buckets, I think it starts to naturally, you start to naturally, you know, ease into the others because there's pieces of this that, that exist. So if you look at something like GDPR, right? GDPR was essentially, um, Previous to GDPR, there was always an, an implicit uh, requirement of saying you must know what data you have, where it is, right? So there's governance implicit in that. Um, I think GDPR actually made it explicit. <clears throat> so I think you know when you start to practice any one of these areas, it's it, there's a natural I think tendency to start to understand what some of these other areas start to do, and you can start to I think ease into it that way. Lynn. Yeah, the other thing I would say is, is don't be frightened to reach out to people through your network who, who are having to do these, these things, uh, perform these functions. Most people are more than happy to share, you know, challenges they've run into or he has a good starting point. I, I know this is pretty, pretty much common sense and, and a bit of a... Um, and, uh, it. it it's not great sage advice, but that is the reality. That's how many of us have, have built expertise uh, over time. 
is the goodwill of others who came before us who were willing to share. No, that's 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 I totally agree with you both. And that that does bring us in to some key tips where we can bring this knowledge to the folks who are here today. So um, I'm going to go back and forth between us on some of these points. Um, as I expected, we're we're going to be a little short on time because all, there's already a fair number of additional questions. But Lynn, over to you on the first one. Shift your perspective on who your customer is. Yeah. So so this was key for us. Uh, as I called out, we don't see the regulators or the auditors or our data subjects as our customers. Just to be to be very clear. For our privacy program, our customer at the end of the day are the people who have to implement the requirements. And we're entirely geared around that. And the other piece of advice to go with that is listen to them. They are far closer um, to the actual implementation and having to meet those requirements. They know where they're running into challenges. Take that feedback to heart, figure out how you can adjust to, to better support them. That's great. Um, and then Samir, I mean, there's there's a lot for us to discuss. So let's come through this. I want to make sure we get at least a quick walkthrough. So Samir, leverage and build off existing tools and programs. I think as uh, Lynn and I both kind of mentioned is, you know, trying to understand exactly what is being done in each of these areas across these kind of the three what we call silos. Um, so that way you can kind of really get uh, clear and uh, efficient spend and effectiveness. So, you know, if data governance is doing something in terms of data cataloging, getting metadata, privacy should be there with them and understanding what are they doing and how can it serve their purposes and vice versa. Um, so kind of whoever's out that gate start to understand what are those processes, what are the tools that exist? Yeah, totally agree. Um, I have number three. So establish a common vocabulary goals and KPIs with the data governance team. If you have, and it might be the data governance team, it might be your IT team, but we have found a lot of benefit in making sure that there's a written and a sort of meeting of the minds between what the two teams are actually trying to accomplish. Um, the data governance side is often really driven by enabling maximal but ethical use of data that's been collected in an organization. And it might've been collected for a consumer facing program. And now the organization wants to use it to improve services for those same customers, solve broader customer problems, improve the delivery of the service. It might be used for security, but it's really about maximal use on the data governance side. The data security side obviously is often primarily motivated by understanding the systems and protecting them appropriately. Privacy, you know, some of the goals from data privacy teams aren't totally well understood by governance teams and IT. We see the miscommunications all the time. So if there are written understandings of here are what we're trying to accomplish and here are our KPIs, it can really uh, accelerate things. And as I mentioned, we see a lot of disconnects between what is a data catalog, what is data lineage, what is an asset inventory, and making sure people have a common understanding of those different elements can be critical. Um, and that takes us into focus on solving the actual problem in front of you. Um, you know, Samir, I think you made this point, but, you know, years ago, when companies were first standing up their first privacy programs under GDPR, there was almost a rush to say, we need to know what the data is and, and start doing that by quote business process. And often there were, there were pretty significant data discovery exercises, that means often going into big unstructured data stores and spending on scanning and trying to do data discovery in structured data systems, for example, which could be valuable, but might not be valuable depending on what you're trying to achieve. So, you know, really understanding what are you trying to do? What is your biggest risk and where should you be spending your time 
can help define where you should be doing data discovery, where you should be doing asset inventories, where you should be focused on data lineage and making sure you map the problem to the solution ends up being quite beneficial to a lot of companies so that they're not just diving into data discovery in every system where that's often not necessary. Um, back to having technical people on your privacy team, Lynn. Yeah, so while we haven't explicitly called this out, you will see from a lot of the solutioning that we're talking about, it makes a lot of sense to have technical solution focused people in your privacy team, as opposed to a team that is purely compliance or legal. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm gonna park that right there because there are still two more points to cover. Well, terrific. And I know, again, there's some questions. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have you think about this one before we go back to Samir, but Lynn, I hear this all the time. I would love to see an example where Lynn has cracked the code on removing legally. So if you could think about that before we come back to you. Uh, but Samir, uh, use data to determine where you have risk. Yeah, uh, I think we're all data professionals, but a lot of times we're not really good at using data to drive where our data risk is. And I kind of like how Lynn mentioned it before, of moving away from that gut feel and actually showing it something, you know, move, move to the quantitative versus some of the less of the qualitative as much as you can. Yep. Uh, and that brings me to number seven, allow for your privacy program to evolve. Um, there is nothing wrong with starting with manual collection of the data, manual collection and production of the reporting, because it gives you some baseline understanding of what is it you need to report on and what are the insights that matter to you as an organization. And you have to get started somewhere. You know, if, if there's a lot we've covered today in terms of efficiency of scale and collecting the data, seeing and managing the program and then getting the right reporting. And so starting, starting somewhere and then understanding what you need to show and then starting to focus on revising the program for scalability is, is a very natural way to go. And I, I think it is a good way to start. Um, so we're, we're, I knew again, we'd, we'd have less time than we wanted. So Lynn, I think we do get a fair number of questions around the point I just highlighted, which is how do you crack the code? Do you have any guidance or, or suggestions for this community on how did you manage to get that painful process minimized of going back and forth between engineers and privacy folks? So the answer is actually in the question as it's framed up. Sometimes an example is worth a thousand words. Often when we say, do you have, do you collect or process personal data? We give examples of what that is, what, what would fall into that. Similarly, sensitive data is one of those other nice amorphous buckets. We literally provide four or five examples of what, what sensitive data would be. It, it's taking the legal language out of the question as much as possible and providing concrete examples within the context of that engineering um, world. So the IP address is a, a great one. We run into the same. We explicitly call that out as one of our examples. Uh, that's, that's great advice. And building them in in simple, understandable examples is probably critical, then, right, in order to scale in that way? Yep, and again, the, these none of this is particularly sage advice, but where we, as much as possible, we try to structure um, our questions and guidance in standard ways. We, we frame the question up. There is, wherever relevant, we actually <laughs> explicit examples. And then we also provide um, key links. So anywhere someone goes in the program, they encounter that same structure. So they know exactly what, what they're looking for. So consistency helps with that an enormous amount. But you're not going to get it right all the time. That's why we keep saying, listen to the feedback you're getting and then iterate. And sometimes it takes a few tries, um, but it's rewarding when, when you see the needle, the needle move. No, that makes great sense. Um... Well, let, let me, let's go through. I know we want to set a few more minutes aside um, uh, as we're getting to the end of the line. Um, 
Oh, uh, you know, and then from our side, the wire wheel platform covers a lot of these kinds of requirements. We have some resources coming out of um, today's session, but we have both uh, software offerings for trust access and consent um, from a full CMP solution through notice and trust centers and individual rights management. And of course, on privacy operations, which often leverages the asset inventory and the data discovery side, all the way through privacy assessments and the right scalable kinds of uh, dashboards and reporting. And coming out of today's session, we have not only the, the slides available for the community, um, we have um, background on exactly how you can leverage data governance systems in data subject requests. We have guidelines on different kinds of DSAR metrics and um, other resources for folks today. So uh, we invite you over there to, to see some of these, these resources. Um, and now we have just a few minutes, um, Dave, um, for, for questions. So I'm gonna pivot back to you. We have, a, we have a lot of them for the audience and we covered a lot today between um, Lynn, Samir and myself. So Dave, over to you. Yeah, thanks very much, Justin. Appreciate that. What a fantastic presentation. And unfortunately, we have run out of time. And Justin, you did a terrific job tackling a lot of the questions out of the Q&A there. Um, so you've really uh, handled most of them. Uh, really appreciate you doing that and um, appreciate all the great information that Samir and Lynn were able to provide for us today. So um, Justin, thanks for you sharing your expertise and time with us today. We really appreciate it. And, and uh, Samir and Lynn, thanks very much for making some time out of your day. I know you guys are busy professionals covering stuff. So um, really appreciate you coming on the panel with us today. Dave, thanks, thanks for having us. We really appreciated the chance to share this with the community. And of course, Samir and Lynn, um, great insights from both of you. I suspect folks may have questions afterwards. In fact, there were some. So if there are good ways for us to share our contact information from on behalf of the Wirewheel team, we'd be happy to take them and funnel them along to Samir and Lynn uh, as appropriate and as simply as, in, as emailing info at wirewheel.io. We're happy to share those with, with Samir and Lynn and then get back to anybody who has additional questions. Yeah, thanks for offering that up, Justin. That's terrific. And also um, I'm happy to be a funnel as well. My, I'm very easy to get in contact with. It's dave at iapp.org. So shoot anything over to me and I'll make sure to get it in the hands of anybody over here so we can follow up with those. Appreciate you mentioning that, Justin, because I know there were, there were some other great questions in the, in the um, chat that we didn't get a chance to handle. So that's fantastic. So I want to leave everybody with a, with a request from all of you out there in the audience. You know, we've been working hard through this difficult lockdown time, um, this uh, virtual era, as it were, uh, to try to stay connected to all of you out there in the community, um, the privacy space, and uh, do our best to deliver you the information you need to get your jobs done. Um, and we really want to know how we're doing. You know, we've pivoted, we've changed, we've made adaptations, and uh, we really want feedback. Uh, we talked a lot about that uh, during the program, the, the importance of these feedback loops and the communication. So please, um, uh, my colleague, Jen Clark, who, by the way, has been uh, Running the controls in the background here, big shout out to Jen Clark from the IPP for uh, arranging this program for us today and, and taking care of hosting this uh, from a platform perspective. Um, she's posted a link in the chat. Uh, you can click on that, give us some feedback. Importantly, there's uh, some uh, space in there where you can let us know what topics you'd like to hear about on future programs. So let us know what um, you'd like to hear about and we'll do our best to put that together for you and, and get that information into your hands. Uh, we've got a little incentive for you there too, if you are willing to participate and give us about five minutes. So with that, um, thanks everybody one last time for joining us today. Uh, very much enjoyed the conversation myself and I'm uh, really looking forward to seeing you all virtually again somewhere in the near future. Uh, so with that, we'll take us to a program close. Thanks one last time to everybody. <laughs>